Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this period of COVID-19 pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, Zooming with you, Facebook living with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts, in what is now our third month of sheltering in place. Today's Shelter and Solidarity, our sixth episode, hard to believe we, we are now into our, well into our second month of this project, uh, our sixth episode is going to be a little different today. We're going to try something a little new. Instead of having a panel of prepared guests for you today, we've planned an open discussion, a roundtable, a participatory invitation to talk about what people are reading and what they're learning from it, what they're taking away from books, and articles, things that they've been diving into during the time they may have on their hands during this COVID quarantine. I'll be sharing the, the hosting duties here with, with Tim Sheard, co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity. And uh, we'll be diving in, I hope, not only with each other about what we've been reading and, and how uh, what we've been reading has been relating to the situation we're in, but inviting those who are online right now on Zoom and those who will be joining us later uh, for a spontaneous discussion of, of what we're reading, what we're learning, and what we're taking away from that uh, reading in this, in this COVID moment. Tim, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, Joe. Thanks so much for asking. Yeah, Tim Sheard, everybody. Uh, it's great to have Tim on camera again. He's always there behind the scenes and sometimes in front. Tim, uh, you know, for those who don't know, is uh, you know, a publisher with Hardball Press, where he really specializes in bringing out working class stories uh, in relationship to organizing, but in more broadly. Uh, he also writes for Labor Press and is a novelist in his own right. And I'll let him say more about his work as we go on. But, uh, you know, Tim, uh, you were the one really who proposed the idea for this, this discussion today. And, and in fact, when we began this six, two months ago, and we started talking about this show as the crisis hit us, you know, your first idea was kind of something like this, right? Something just an idea that we could get people together, people perhaps with a left progressive you know, politics, but in an open, organic way, just bring people together to talk about their ideas, what they're thinking, what they're reading, what they're doing, to try to stay sane and stay together th during this crisis. So, so here we are, week six, we're finally doing it. Um, so what do you think? I mean, Tim, how would you like to kick us off? What have you been reading lately, Tim? And, uh, you know, what have you been, I'm interested in what you've been writing too, but what have you been reading? And, and uh, you know, what have you been learning? How is this uh, COVID moment for you been a been a reading moment, a reflective moment. I'd, I'd love to hear what what books are on your uh, on your shelf or on your on your desk. Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you for asking. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. So I'm a, a crime writer. I write uh, novel, crime novels and short stories, and I've long been a fan of the genre. And um, there are certain authors that I go back to time and time again. And during this uh, period of isolation. I know many of us are busier than we've ever been before. We find we have more work and less time to enjoy ourselves uh, than we had when we were going or, you know, when we were out and about. And so we need time to read and to just drift through the story and let the story take us away. So I've been going back to the Martin Beck series. This is one of their uh, best known stories, The Laughing Policeman. The Martin Beck series is a 10 book uh, crime series, a police procedural, it was written by a pair of Marxists in Sweden in the 1960s. And uh, they had the idea that they could use the novel and the investigation of crime to hold up the crimes of the capitalist class that was driving uh, the working class uh, into poverty, alcoholism, spouse abuse, and suicide. So the police officers really, in this case, um, are kind of at their wit's end because they investigate crimes and the wealthy corporate class get away with it. In fact, many of the things that they do aren't even illegal. And when they are illegal, they still get away with it. And so the people that they end up arresting are the uh, lower class uh, people who are, aren't, don't have enough wealth and power to, to escape it. And the time and time again, they reflect on, uh, you know, Woody Guthrie's line, some people rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. Uh, so I, I enjoy reading that because it's a really strong, sharp class analysis about Sweden in the 60s. It's also, uh, for me as an old 
you know, an old guy, an old activist, it's also it's always a pleasure to read a book in the 1960s where the students and the radicals are out in front of the U.S. embassy and they're protesting the U.S. involvement in Vietnam and they're getting their heads clobbered, you know, uh, by the police uh, protesting the U.S. And to think that these authors wrote about this in the 60s is for me is a real treat because I was, you know, in, in going to D.C. on the bus to the protests and having to sit in from school and in college and so on. So for me, it's a kind of a personal uh, pleasure to be, to be, um, you know, to be reading about the, about the students uh, uh, that are, you know, the same time as I was. I also, uh, it's kind of interesting, I think, it's a 10 book series. They decided to stop at 10. And um, uh, Pear Walu, the gentleman, uh, uh, pardon, he died just uh, as the last book was being uh, coming into print. And his uh, wife, Maj Sowell, continued writing in her own right for years and just died just last week, actually. Um, anyway, they wrote these in the 60s, and I first uh, found the books in the 1980s. Uh, I read all of them, and then I gave them away. And then years later, I wanted to go back to them. I went back again. I bought the books again, read them, gave them away. This is the fifth time that I've read this series. And it's to me, it's it's... I don't, it's it's inspiring. It's ennobling that I get more out of it every time I read them. Every time I read them, I discover new things in their writing. I discover what brilliant characters they are that just grab you and come off the page and so real. Their dialogue is great, and their writing style has a beautiful rhythm to it. Uh, that's that just I would I wish I could write as well as they did. I wish I had their their ear for for language. So um, I, something, something reassuring about art, uh, any form of art that you can go back to over and over again and still find it even more uh, engaging, more eye-opening than when you read it the second or the third time. I find that something comforting uh, in going back to an old friend. Um, it's like an old love, you know, there's still love there. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a good feeling to, to go back to them. I, I recommend them highly to anyone who likes crime, crime fiction with a good class analysis. Yeah. Tim, if I could jump in there and, and maybe uh, dive a little deeper with you before we, you know, turn to me or turn to others who are diving, we're diving. We have a, a small, small band here on this, on this sunny, at least in Boston, it's a very sunny day. I think a lot of people getting outside today and getting off of the computer. Um, but I mean, I think that's, that speaks to one point. I mean, you kind of opened by saying, right, a lot of us right now, um, you know, it's, we can feel like we're busier than ever. I think a lot of people are reading probably headlines and news stories, right? I mean, I think the first month of the pandemic, I don't know if I cracked a book except for the ones that I was teaching for my literature uh, classes at UMass Boston, right? I mean, it, there was just so much to read. You felt like it was almost like an unpaid job, right? Just like keeping up. I felt like I was in the war room, you know, in my apartment, in our apartment here, Linda and, and I just kind of you know, keeping up with everything, right? And kind of keeping a file of that. But that's a very particular kind of reading, right? And a very particular kind of focus. And I think you're, you're reminding us uh, of that, that importance of, of having a space to get away from that, uh, you know, to, to be taken away from the immediacy of the headlines in a way that allows a different kind of experience, both psychologically, but also, you know, intellectually uh, and even politically, right? Sometimes you need to kind of, at least one of the assumptions of a kind of literature from a political perspective might be that sometimes we need to step away from the kind of urgent immediacy of reality in order to come back to it, right? With a deeper, uh, more historical or a deeper, more kind of uh, profound kind of feeling about the very sorts of life and death issues that are, are very much in the headlines, right? You don't need to go to fiction uh, to find drama these days. Uh, you know, I, I like what you said about coming back to a book that you've read before too, right? I mean, one crude definition of literature I give my students in my, my Six American Authors class is like, you could say literature is a book or any piece of writing that's worth reading twice, right? Which is to say, you know, not just for information, right? And then throw it away, right? But something that's worth coming back to. And of course, we come back for so many different reasons. But 
Um, I think this point you make about crime fiction, right, or, you know, crime and detective and the way that that form can be used by Marxists or critical, critical, uh, socially critical people, right, I think is very important. I wanted to actually turn that, use that as a, as a kind of a wedge or a, a pivot to turn it back to you as a writer, because you, you have written yourself a, a growing series of novels, um, which I am looking forward to reading, Tim, uh, but they are, if I have it right, they are not exact, exactly crime fiction, but they are kind of mystery fiction, but you make the decision breaking with the, in or bending from the long tradition of crime and mystery novels focused on police or private eyes, and you put a nurse, is that right? A nurse kind of at, at the center of these kind of medical mystery novels. So could you say a little bit more about that? I don't mean to put you on the spot too much, but to hear a little bit about, you know, your project in general and how you see the writing is related to kind of some of the stuff you were just talking about as a reader. And also, if you are ready to talk about it, how this COVID moment has, uh, whether it's inspired or connected with, I understand you even have a book that might be kind of prescient in this way uh, that talks about a pandemic. Can you, can you say a little bit more about your writer's perspective? Uh, thank you, Joe. And th this was un unplanned, by the way. I want people totally to know. Totally catching totally him off guard here. It's all but, spontaneous. But, but seriously, um, yeah, no, many years ago, I've been a nurse. I've retired now 43 years of hospital duty. And early, after working many years in the hospital, I decided that I wanted to write about the hospital workers who were really underappreciated and, and deserve a great more, great more credit than they get. Uh, today, we talk about the healthcare heroes and we talk about the essential workers and we sort of recognize them now in the, in the media. Sometimes they're recognizing their courage, their value, their dedication, the fear that they that that they that they uh, that they experience going into these uh, nursing homes and, and hospitals, uh, it's a very very tough for them. So I wanted to write stories that showed them because most of the you know novels, if they were medical mysteries or they were TV shows, they put the doctor as the hero, which you know, is fine. You know that's 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 fine. That's that, that, that's legitimate. But I wanted to show all the workers who really delivered the care and made the care possible. So I have actually a shop steward detective. He's a hospital custodian. He's been he's inspired by a dear friend of mine who's an 1199 steward. And the novels involve uh, a union struggle that, that, that he's involved in and a m murder. So I, I intertwine the two uh, together. Um, but I think more importantly than, than what I'm writing is I'm getting reports from nurses and and nurses aides and union organizers in the field who are working in the hospitals and they're working in the nursing homes and they're telling me their raw stories and I think it's really important to get those stories out because when you read the stories in the New York Times and, and the other journals you know at the Atlantic they're good they're informative not to knock them but they're kind of sanitized and they don't express the horror that the that people can feel, the absolute dread and the the, the, the terrible danger, uh, they're kind of softened quite a bit. And so I think, so I've been lucky enough to be uh, gathering stories from some of the hospital workers on the front lines and been able to report on them at Labor Press, which I recommend to all our readers to, to read laborpress.org uh, because it really gives you a sense of, um, the depth of the tragedy and the horror of what they're, they're this one hospital has three refrigerator trucks parked outside the hospital at the peak in in mid-march they had they had three hospital refrigerator trucks filled with bodies and you know that's that's not something you see reported in the, in the everyday media so i think it's important to get those stories out so we know re who the real heroes are Uh, what can you uh, tell us? Yeah, no, sorry about that. I know I'm the host. I shouldn't have that happen to me. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for that. I mean, I really like the way you turned, you know, the discussion of writing also back to organizing and or back to labor issues and the importance of recognizing, you know, the work uh, that people do and, and the raw edges that often don't make it into mainstream accounts, even when essential frontline workers do factor into the, the broader public narrative at all. And you know, it really reminds me, I mean, I know like we were planning, we were planning this uh, relatively informal episode. And, and those of you who are on online right now, it's great to have about a dozen of you ready to 
to pro hope some of you will share your thoughts in a moment. But Tim and I had originally planned to kind of go back and forth with a, a couple of books that we've been reading. Uh, and, I, and I'm still ready to do that. I have, a, I, have a, I have a couple books here ready to talk about. But frankly, the last couple days at UMass Boston, as I was telling Tim just before the show, uh, we were hit with uh, several hundred faculty or hit with non-reappointment letters, effectively would amount to kind of layoffs um, as a result of budget concerns at the administration level, uh, what looks to them like a playing it safe strategy from the top, right, by sending non-reappointment letters to maybe over 300 non-tenure track faculty. And I, I'm actually, the different hats I wear here, you know, one of them is a union rep um, at UMass Boston. So I've been working with faculty who have been experiencing this great trauma. And in fact, one of the great breakthroughs of the last couple of days has been trying to work with faculty, non-tenure track faculty, despite their fear about being brought back or not, their, their precarity, as we say, right? To get them to tell their stories, right? Whether, you know, on camera or through writing, right? Uh, and in fact, um, the last couple of days, I was working with a, with a faculty member who was, you know, literally on the last day of class telling students, you know, her, her first year students at UMass Boston that their perspective matters, you know, the last day of class, you know, words can be powerful. Don't let this world kick you around, right? You have a voice and if you put it into the right form, your voice can be powerful and you can make a difference. And then the, the very next day gets hit with a non reappointment letter herself and is suddenly realizing that as she's trying to empower these predominantly working class students with their writing, she now is in the perspective, uh, in, in the position of being the powerless, right? And I won't give away the rest of her piece, but she said she decided to write about it and it's really powerful. And it just reminded me, Tim, something we've talked about off the show, uh, and maybe the, un the relatively untapped potential uh, the opportunity of getting workers themselves, whether they're academic labor or not, obviously academics may be for better and for worse, you know, more used to using written words, um, you know, as their tool of their trade. But, you know, the idea that writing, reading and writing stories can actually be a very powerful thing from an organizing perspective. I, just in the course of going back and forth with this faculty member, uh, actually, who will, whose piece will be published so, soon. She found a publisher for it within a matter of days. It's really great to see. Uh, it'll be coming out soon. I won't spoil it, but I'll, I'll stay tuned for that, um, hopefully by the end of this week. But, you know, just the writing of it, she said, was incredibly cathartic, right? I mean, she was feeling depressed and angry and powerless. And just the, you know, the idea of taking that energy, directing it into a narrative form, even if it hadn't been published, she said, it would have been really worthwhile. Right. So, I mean, in terms of what we've been reading and what we've been taking away, actually, I was expecting to talk about Greg Grandin's book on, uh, you know, the closing of the American frontier. Right. Uh, the end of the myth. It's a great, great book. Just won the Pulitzer. But really what I've been doing day to day is thinking about this connection between organizing and writing and, and thinking not only that it's important at UMass right now to try to raise consciousness about the human costs. Right of budget cuts and budget preparations and, and bringing out the stories that are underneath the numbers, right? That as they appear on high, right? The, um, and bringing out really the soul of our university and, and, and not only the, 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 the human suffering, but the human like talent and aspiration of these workers that often get kicked around like they don't matter. Even, even people with you know, higher degrees and higher learning. Um, but I'm but I'm thinking not only about UMass right now. I'm thinking more generally about the labor movement, you know, and 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 social justice movements generally. It seems to me when workers and other oppressed people are brought to the the point of telling their story and getting it right, you know, and having it strike a chord, that that's potentially a really transformative process. It's not just a matter of information delivery, right? Which it, it also is, right? But there's something not just objective about it, the facts that can be delivered, but something subjective, right, that can transform both the writer into a state of feeling more courageous and bold, right, and the reader, right? Absolutely, and absolutely that, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so honestly, that's where I, where I had to go today because just that's been my week since, you know, the administration decided to, to basically at least put these people on notice that they're going to be the first ones to go if people have to go, right? Not the people 
that are making six figures, 200, 300 grand, and don't teach students. But the people who teach, as this faculty member I was talking about, taught nine classes in the past year, more than the, the usual full-time load of eight. They took an extra course, which is like three times sometimes what uh, some tenure track folks teach. Not sure. Nothing against the tenure track folks, but, and that these are the people that are getting picked on, right? And I think the assumption here, the system assumes they're not gonna tell their story or their stories are not gonna get out there. And I just, I just wanna change that. I don't know, you know, maybe we can talk about hardball press, I know, and labor press and other, but I mean, how can we, how can we get people to tell their stories and, 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 and in, a, in a form, you know, that can really resonate. And, right. and, and, and uh, so that we're not, in a way that just doesn't burn people out with more indignation, and, you know, but also really raises the level and the spirit of the struggle sure. for the writers and the readers. Sure. Well, writing uh, in isolation is difficult, but when you get workers together uh, and writing together, then it really builds their 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 union uh, solidarity and it builds their self confidence. So, if you get some of these uh, laid off workers to be like this in a meeting, you start a Facebook group, you get a Zoom collective, they write their stories. When they write together and then they read them aloud and they share their stories it really builds their sense of unity and they say, we can make a difference. We can, uh, we can make a difference. 1199 in New England has been really had some great leadership in their training and upgrades fund. And they've um, offered uh, writing workshops to their nursing home workers. And it's brought a lot of their workers closer to the union. A number of them have become officers in the union. They become shop stewards. And it's helped them in their, in their battles when they go to contract. It's made them much stronger. And they've even uh, testified before the Connecticut Legislature Subcommittee on Long-Term Care. And they've been, been a powerful voice at the legislature because they wrote these stories and being a writer and being published and, and being part of a group that's writing uh, has given them the confidence to stand up and talk to these politicians. So uh, you, yeah, I agree, your, your adjuncts and others who are being laid off, working together in, in, in groups and writing and then publishing their stories, whether it's online, Send, give it them to local media. It can be a really a, a important part of the of the fight uh, to get their jobs back and to and to you know to to, to give them a, a, a fair fair share of what they deserve. Yeah, I think you you hit a really important point, Tim. And we're going to open it up to uh, to the some of the folks on that are joining us online in just a moment. Um, I think Mary. Uh, we have Mary's iPad, um, and. Uh, and I think it's Mary on Mary's iPad, I hope, and then, and Richard, but I, I'm just going to make one quick point and then we'll open it up, which is that, I mean, I think writing and reading and working together on language, right, can uh, develop, as you say, confidence and courage mm -hmm. in people. And I think that's, I often feel like a neglected part of what uh, the struggle right now. It's not just that people don't know things, right, but they don't feel the confidence, right, to actually, to really confront people in power, right? with with what they know and i think you know it's one way to think about writing and reading right is developing that ability to go beyond just knowing something abstractly and really put it forth in a, in a way that can that can make a difference and i think i don't know we can go on about that but i feel like that's an uh, maybe a neglected part of uh i think that something we could go deeper into and that i think uh you know the, the relationship between reading writing and, and political organizing and frankly developing courage in people that have been treated like objects by the system too often sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's let's take. I think we had uh, Richard first, actually, on the. Uh, Richard, are you out there? You have a question, or uh, you want to talk a little bit about um, something you've been reading, Richard? Looks like he stepped away, uh, Joe. Oh, oh, that's his house. Okay. How about Mary? Let's go to Mary, and we'll come back to Richard. Mary, I see that you uh, you would like to you would like to speak. We're just uh, we're welcoming you into the dialogue as well. Mary, are you there? But she's muted. Can you unmute her? Uh, Kira could probably. Yeah, I'm here, but Richard just sat down, so I'll defer to him and go next. Oh, well, you know what, what Mary, why don't you, Richard didn't, may not even know that we're calling on him. You, are you ready? Why don't you go? Mary, you go, and then we'll go to Richard, and I see my uh, friends and comrades, uh, John Mayerhofer and, and Victor Wallace are online, and Dave, Bert, and some other folks I know, and people I don't, so hopefully everyone can, we'll open up some space, and I, you know, I won't talk so much. Take it away, Mary. I, well, I, um, I, just, I want to say two things. I thought about this in, in anticipation of tonight's discussion. Uh, the first is, um, 
I'm finding it harder to read mm. in general. I mean, I'm an avid reader. Um, when when uh, Tim, Tim and I were sick in, in March and we each had turns of self-quarantining, we don't know if it was actually COVID, but we had the flu. Um, and, uh, and I thought, oh, great. And I stocked up uh, through uh, Kindle on all, all these books. Like um, I've been following the Wolf Hall series and Hilary Mantel's final book in the trilogy came out. And I thought, oh, good. I'm finally going to read, you know, read the demise of, of Thomas Cromwell. And, um, but I found that um, I lacked the focus for deep reading. I, and I, you know, and I um, came to realize that I, I think it's a, a reflection of, of the more intensely then, I not as much now, but this just free floating anxiety. I, um, I just found it hard to, to read uh, books of, of real substance. And um, I switched to mysteries, but nothing as profound as Tim's just old mysteries from the 30s that were just kind of comforting that I've had around for a long time um, and flitted through the paper a lot. I'm usually a you know, co cover to cover reader of the New York Times, but it over March and April and now into May, it's the same devastating news from the ruling class. I mean, it shouldn't surprise us, but you know, nothing's changing or it's only getting worse. And it, so it's hard. So that's one piece I wanted to mention is that yeah. personally, I find it hard to get into really substantive reading. I find it um, just kind of impossible. On the other hand, I do have to give a pitch for uh, my, the, the one thing that I always find uplifting, which is a challenge newspaper, um, a communist newspaper that has really in its pages printed, um, mm -hmm the efforts of people to organize who are not on a job right now, but are trying to find ways to be in touch with the working class when, you know, with all these social restrictions to, to, to address our class in terms of, um, we don't have to disappear. We, we have to reflect the, the, the correct social distancing and cautions, but we don't have to disappear. And some very inspiring articles from every place from uh, Chicago and Indiana to uh, Haiti and uh, East Africa. Um, so I, I do read Challenge and that's very encouraging. Uh, it's Challenge newspaper, you can find it online. But, but I'm, sick of the, <laughs> I'm sick of the boss's press, I'm sick of the Times, I'm sick of uh, Cuomo's, um, you know, I'm a hero, I'm doing so great when he's one, of the one that led the, the push over the last 20 years to close hospitals or 12 years to close hospitals in this in this state um and also just if if people i maybe I, other if other do other people feel this question of like not being able to focus you know it's just it's it's a stressful time it's very stressful so that's it I'm, i i i don't want to yeah i think that's a really important point mary i mean um people can check out challenge as well but that that point you made about you know, the anxiety and the difficulty deep reading and focusing. I mean, obviously, maybe I should have started the whole discussion today by saying, obviously, having the time to read at all is a kind of privilege, right, that is not afforded to many people, just as quarantining is not available to most people on earth, right? And, and, and even in this country, many, many people, working class in particular, don't have the luxury of staying home and, and in fact, are scrambling, even if they may be jobless, or not have to go to work, that itself is a source of great anxiety and is a kind of job in itself, right? So I think, I mean, obviously, I think, I hope that's understood among people who are on this Zoom call, right? We're not, we're not just reveling in our privilege here, right? But as you point out, even if you have the time, space, you know, a little bit of buffer to potentially read, you know, read War and Peace or something, right? It's like, it may not be happening because there's all this stress and psychology and the energy you have. There's like this compulsion, you know, compu for me, I mean, it's still every day. It's like, I got to spend three hours just reading like the new, the news and maybe a little analysis of the news before I can get to anything else. And then and I'm actually, I'm losing steam for some of that too. You know, I feel like it's, it's like a, you get a kind of burnout. I used to read every day, right? The headlines at least, and then major articles, Boston and New York, and then some national and, and now it's like, 
Ugh. I mean, our semester wrapped up too, so it's hard for me to separate, you know, the last week of classes from this other side of things. But a lot of time on the computer too, I think, right? We're staring at screens all day. There's something to be said for getting off of the screen. Not, not this one, of course, during this show, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Linda, uh, let's see, uh, Richard, actually, you were, um, Richard. you were wanting to speak as well. Uh, Tim, unless you want to, you want to respond no, no, no. to Mary or you want to go to Richard? Richard. Let's go to Richard. Well, uh, I'm happy to say something about my reading, but, uh, for, but when I initially spoke, it was just, I wanted to get the name of uh, one of Tim's novels. I think I would like to read uh, about uh, a mystery and uh, from the point of view of uh, an 1199 hospital janitor. So can you uh, pass on uh, something that I could get my hands sure. on? Sure. Well, of the nine books in this series, I would go with the eighth one, which is called One Foot in the Grave. And the reason I recommend One Foot is that I described a, 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 a kind of an epidemic uh, of a virulent new strain of the Zika virus. And pregnant women were terrified. And there was a shortage of PPEs, a shortage of isolation gowns, a shortage of negative pressure rooms in the hospital, and there was all this scrambling to try and retrofit everything so they could make room for all this, uh, you know, wash big wash of, of Zika cases. And this was two years ago, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. It's kind of yeah. funny to it's funny to read about it, but it's 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 it's, it's interesting to read about it because some of the, I wish some of the hospitals were doing what my characters did in my book because they'd be a lot better off. Well, it's, it reminds me, Tim, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to toot your horn too much till I read your books, but I'm, I'm remembering Karl Marx is a, it should be famous comment. I believe that he, re, he learned more about capitalism uh, by reading Balzac uh, than he did from reading all of English, I think, British political economy, something <laughs> like that. Maybe, I mean, I may be butchering it, but something to be uh. said for the, pre, the prescience, right, of a writer who goes deep into something even in a fictional way, based on obviously a lot of real world experience and investigation in your case as a nurse, um, you know, and it would illuminate something, right? Years ahead of when it actually occurs in the real world. Sure. Richard, right? did you, have a, you want to talk about what you're reading, Richard? Uh, yes, sure. Um, well, uh, I, uh, I do a lot of community development work in Latin America, primarily in Nicaragua and uh, but first I wanted to respond to Mary because both uh, me and my wife, Susan, found ourselves having difficulty reading in the, uh, probably uh, almost the first three weeks of our self-isolation. And I think it has to do with what was already said, this general level of anxiety. Uh, I have a compromised health uh, position and uh, so I was terrified about all of this uh, and I think that affected uh, uh, we ended up uh, spending more time at night uh, watching a television series that we don't normally do uh, that seemed <laughs> that, that seemed easier emotionally than reading uh, but uh, fortunately uh, 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 I managed to settle down so um, uh, I've uh, been uh, following uh, uh, any kind of information that illuminates the possibility that the uh, virus uh, came out of the Wuhan lab through uh, research funded by none other than Dr. Fauci's organization, which in fact uh, funded gain, uh, what do you call it, gain of function research on the bat viruses in the Wuhan lab from 1914 through new, uh, 2019, uh, and uh, the purpose of which was to create a coronavirus which would jump from bats to humans in order to create an antidote to such a virus. So uh, I've been doing a lot of research and reading on that, and uh, that is indeed one of the live possibilities for how this virus was brought to us, something that uh, was created with U.S. funding in the Wuhan lab and escaped from the writing on uh, 
the new generation of nuclear weapons, a tor terrifying thing that will be very destabilizing and bring us much closer to nuclear war. And on uh, the Yemen war and Raytheon's role in it uh, with my uh, research writing and organizing work with mass peace action, both on the nuclear weapons front and the um, Yemen war uh, slash Raytheon front. Uh, and uh, so that uh, has kept me kind of busy, but I finally found time to start reading books again uh, recently. And being as though I'm a long time Latin, America's, Latin Americanist, I, I want to strongly recommend uh, a new release, Coffee Land, which is about uh, uh, what for a period of time was the leading uh, coffee family in El Salvador, and uh, it goes up through the 1930s, and uh, and it's uh, uh, taught me things I, I did not know before about labor relations in uh, El Salvador, and it fascinatingly describes the spread of uh, coffee production in El Salvador, followed by the spread of coffee production, both of which, uh, took up so much of the arable land that there was very little left to grow food for the population, which uh, made the population dependent on the coffee companies for their very survival, for their very food. Uh, and that made it possible to control the population and make them obedient workers on the coffee uh, plantations. Anyway, it's an it's a excellent uh, read. Uh, and yeah. I've been trying, I've been trying to uh, uh, get back into expanding my limited knowledge uh, about Africa, and uh, have found Breaking Sudan uh, an excellent uh, 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 read uh, about uh, uh, what's been going on in Sudan for the past fifty years. Uh, longest civil war on the planet, kind of tied with the civil war in Colombia. And, uh, and uh, but uh, having the lead uh, for the most refugees. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, it yeah. all is still continuing with yeah. the struggles between North and South Sudan and uh, the unfortunate civil war in South Sudan since its independence in 2011. And uh, not a particularly great read, but great for expanding my information about Africa, a recent book on Burkina Faso, uh, which uh, uh, tells uh, quite a bit about uh, Burkina Faso history of the last generation. And back to my general area of interest, uh, I, I don't remember when this, I think this is a new one also, 2019, I think. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, 2007. Uh, I, I'd, uh, of course, always in, enjoyed Bitter Fruit, which was uh, an excellent rendition of the CIA coup in Guatemala in 1954, which made the ruling class adore uh, the things that the CIA could do, because it was such a successful coup d'etat. Uh, and uh, this is more of the backstory about a United Fruit Company, which is largely really responsible for the coup in Guatemala. And this is more of the backstory of the history okay. uh, uh, of the history of United Fruit, which of course its main main product was bananas. Uh, but this is uh, excellent for more of the background about uh, United Fruit and its various yeah. activities. In yeah. Various, uh, yeah, if I could Latin jump American countries. Yeah, um, great. If I could jump in there, Richard, I mean, uh, first off, I mean, I, I actually take my students in my one of my classes back when we still met in person to, to actually the former headquarters of United Fruit, right, in Boston, right, you know, right where, uh, you know, hub of world imperialism, right in our backyard, um, down by the water, you know, downtown Boston. Um, but I, one thing that strikes me from your reading selections, which I really appreciate, um, is, um, is the international like the, the the emphasis on 
on internationalism, right? And, and getting a global perspective, something that is very unlikely we get from our mainstream, you know, bourgeois media, right? Well, the internet may help things somewhat, but I think we really, one, one reason we do need to go to books still is often to get deep dives into this history and, you know, outside of a kind of US centric framework, right? I think that's, that's really, uh, really crucial. Uh, I want to I want to bring in another voice here, um, and we can certainly refer back to what each other is, has raised. But um, Linda Liu, who uh, happens to be my comrade, colleague, and and partner, is on the line as well. Linda uh, has uh, actually I'll say one nice thing about Linda before she is, talks about her reading. She actually is the artist who created the the slow, uh, rather the logo for Shelter and Solidarity, among other things. So so uh, you know behind the scenes we've had a few kind of assistant uh, producers that have helped us make this show happen. And Linda, of course, has had to put up with me being stressed out of my mind. No, getting up, just <laughs> doing all the prep for the show, my you know fifth job. Uh, but Linda's actually online. We moved the show to 7 p.m., so now she's not teaching during the show. And I believe she is online right now. Linda, are you there? Yes, I am here. Hey, Linda. So, yes. uh, Linda, um, what have you been reading? lately and uh what do you what what has been uh you know what has stood out to you in terms of this uh this moment as a moment of reading uh this covid quarantine moment uh and the reading you've been doing okay so i have to i have to sympathize with mary and everybody else who feels that they can't really get into reading anything other than what's in the news I, I was definitely stuck in that phase for quite a while, uh, for much of March and uh, pretty much all of April. And now I'm getting a little tired of it. But um, in that time, I was actually able to read a few fictional things. I've watched a lot of things because I feel like watching things, I can actually get into this fully absorbed mode better than when I'm reading. And, but I have been able to read um, this one book, at least. Um, it's called Severance by Ling Ma. And it's kind of like a post-apocalyptic scenario that has maybe one too many resemblances to our current situation for comfort. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's about this uh, fungus that that's very contagious and it causes something that uh, they call in the novel Shen fever. And Shen fever is based on the, the city in China where, it, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that book because it was, there was so much in there just, just that was resonant for our time. And at the same time, I thought it was going to be a thriller that was uh, going to be about a global pandemic and what people are doing to fight it. But it was also about a lot of other things. So it's, it's by a Chinese American author and it's also just about the general notion of severance, like, like multiple layers of severance. So um, the narrator herself is uh, an, a second generation Asian, well, Ch Chinese immigrant. And uh, so she feels like this loss of her homeland, this not loss of her native language, but also it's about kind of severance from her kind of normal workaday routine, um, given this new pandemic and, and just about a sense of uh, routine. And, in itself like a sense of normalcy like a severance from you know pre-pandemic times and so now everybody has to kind of deal with this this uh this huge disruption um and and in this world in the world of the novel they've actually uh, well the the fungus has actually wiped out most of the population so yeah linda so this is actually a book I've read as well, right? We actually read it, yeah. we, we, and it was recommended, um, you know, to to me by a, actually a, a former student 
um, who, who had read. I was asking for books that kind of resonate with this moment. And I mean, I, I couldn't put the book down. I really recommend it. It's really, really well written. Mm -hmm. It's also not just, it's not only too similar. It's not too similar. Would you agree, Linda, that it's not like it's, it's, it has an ironic aspect, a kind of dark humor aspect of it. It like kind of winks and nods. It knows the zombie apocalypse movie movies and, and books. And it kind of riffs off of some of those themes that we're mm -hmm. familiar with, but in a way that is not just reproducing them, but also kind of creates a little bit of a kind of witty kind of distance. The narrative voice, right, has a real like sarcastic wit. And it's also like a really interesting book about capitalism, right? Without giving too much away, the main character, right, who wants to be a kind of photographer and who's dating a, a, a literary artist, works in, not in book publishing, like not in editing or writing, right, but works in book production, uh, helping to outsource the manufacture of books to low wage, uh, low wage uh, production facilities in China. She's actually in charge of pr the production of different versions of the Bible. So the book is very much about the global US-China kind of trade and capitalist relations, right? And like, so even before, even though we're hearing about this Shen fever, right? Before that, the Chinese workers, there's getting reports in the office about the Chinese workers that are getting glass dust in their lungs from the nice pretty little jewels that go on the teenage, like the teeny bopper version of the Bible that the company is charged with producing, right? So you have a sense of how, one of the things about this you know, book is that it's, it's, it's post-apocalyptic, right? Like there's a, disease that changes everything, but it's also about how capitalism has already been creating dystopia and laying the seeds for apocalypse slowly mm -hmm. for decades, for, you know, for centuries before the disease shows up, mm -hmm. right? right? So I think one of the things that's interesting about it is like, it's almost hard to say, when did the plague start, you know? Did, yeah, yeah, it's difficult to say. Not, yeah, what do you think, of, Linda, do you wanna say a little more? Yeah, and then we'll go to John next. Yeah, and and, um, and I think that's what's interesting about how they're portraying this particular disease is that the fungus that causes it travels along supply chains. So it's it's just you know these these Bibles from you know that are manufactured in China are <laughs> transmitting this this disease globally. Yeah, which <laughs> which which is really interesting, right? Um, so it's not necessarily people, it's, it's products that are, right. that are kind of propagating this. So, yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's a key point. We won't, we won't give away more than that, you know, but, but it's really worth a read and it's not too depressing to like pick up. It actually, I think, has a really fresh perspective on kind of, you know, this whole idea of like end of the world type stuff. So right. b before we go to, to John, just to remind people, if you if you click on participants, uh, you can um, you can raise your hand. There's a way to raise your hand, right? No, it's with chat. If you click on the chat logo, there's a place where you can raise your hand. So if you'd like to bring, uh, if you'd like yeah. to raise your voice, you can raise your hand through Zoom, and then uh, we can yeah. call on you. You can send a you can send a note through the chat box, or raise your hand uh, on the participants list, and you can do both if you if you want to make sure we actually see you. Um, so uh, I see Nicole has a hand up, so we'll go to John, and then we'll go to Nicole. John, take it away. Like what you've been reading, my friend. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, well, before I do that, I mean, yeah, I also think that um, I get wrapped up every day in, in just reading about what's going on, um, whatever. I mean, not, I mean, I've sort of given up on corporate media sources in, in general, but um, you know, there's a lot of people just writing about stuff, right? Um, whether it's, you know, perspectives on uh, how we've come to this point um, and so forth. So I, I, I've, I've been sort of wrapped up in like, so, so there, you know, that sort of takes up a lot of my time in terms of, you know, what I'm thinking about and um, which actually leads to what I'm reading. But um, I was, before I get into that, I was um, also wanted to comment on the, you know, the question of the adjunct issue that's going on now. Yeah, you know, I was an adjunct for 16, 17 years at the City University of New York before I moved to Rutgers, where I'm also contingent, but I have a full time position like like Joe and Linda. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I've written sort of about 
this myself a bit, uh, as some of us have. And, you know, often when I see it and in, in the sort of narrative that often gets um, used um, to depict the struggle of, of contingent labor in, in, in academia is, is one of two things which I think are problematic. And, you know, I wonder if we can move past that or maybe think about how to, you know, reframe that narrative. And both, you know, one of them is sort of the woe is me sort of scenario is like, you know, people just sort of saying, well, you know, I'm going through all this stuff, you know, I have to, I can't pay my bills and all this stuff like that. And, you know, administrators and stuff and go, oh, that's so horrible. And they sort of go on with their lives and, you know, they sort of like, goes over people's heads and of course that that part of it's very important but it's not some something is missing there the other the other one is sort of like the, the sort of what people call the quit lit thing you know like i'm just i'm leaving academia now i want to i want to write about why and how i'm so much better in some corporate position and all of you are still in you know sort of trudging through the sort of adjunct thing well you know you should quit too kind of um so i wonder if there's another narrative there you know one of building sort of solidarity, one of like pushing forward, um, um, you know, sort of anti-capitalist perspective that's, you know, that goes beyond either one of those two things. So, but anyway, so, so what I'm reading, I'm so conveniently I'm reading uh, Rob Wallace's um, Big Farms Make Big Flu. And, um, and basically everyone, everything I'm reading just predicts, you know, how we've come to this point. I mean, Rob Wallace, if you don't know, is, uh, I guess he calls himself, um, an evolutionary ecologist, um, but he traces, you know, uh, viruses and, um, but he's very, he's very deeply, um, you know, political and, and it's not just about sort of, you know, showing, um, you know, what these viruses are and, you know, the particulars of the path, you know, the pathways of them, but also looked at the broad, uh, the broader perspective and, you know, he's very anti-capitalist. Um, what, what, what led me to, to read Rob, Rob Wallace was Mike Davis, of course, who wrote about this in 2006. He wrote a, he, a book called, it, maybe some of you know it, um, The Monster at Our Door, which I, I taught many times when I was uh, at the College of Staten Island. And, um, you know, he's also tracing it through a kind of social lens, right? The, uh, the ways in which influenza works. And so that sort of brought me to Rob Wallace. And um, yeah, you know, so it's, it's um, I think it's important, even though it's, Kind of, you know, um, it's not an escape. It's kind of re-entrenching in the reality of things. But yeah, it's important to read those th these kind of analyses and um, you know, looking at the kind of system, the ways in which you know capitalism reproduces um, uh, pandemics, um, which I think needs to be said, and it's very much missing from the mainstream sort of you know perspective. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that, John. I mean, I, I mean, one point about your your first point about the adjunct and academic labor issues. I mean, you remind us that. Excuse me. <coughs> The question of storytelling is not just about literature or books, it's also about politics, right? If you yeah. finding a different way to get people to symbolize their experience, right? Individually and collectively mm -hmm. is actually a core part of right making another, you know, motivating and inspiring and sustaining, right, uh, the struggle, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, it's narrative is too often, it's, you think narrative, you know, writing separate from politics. Of course, you know, not us, you know, Marxist literary scholars or whatever, but still I think you put it, you know, that, that emphasis on narrative there in daily life, and right? In the struggles we face, I think is important, right? And becoming aware of, you know, those different competing narratives and their problems, right? So we can find a, a different way of thinking. Uh, that's, I think, very useful. I wanted to ask you, uh, if I could, like a follow-up, like what is something that you, since you've taught the Mike Davis before, I know you're just reading the, the Wallace now, perhaps. Yeah. What it, could, could you maybe share an insight you, you gained from the Davis that maybe you, don't, you think that even people who have been following some of this stuff may not have fully appreciated in terms of the relationship, you know, between capital, capitalism, or, and, and this kind of microbiological crisis we're, we're facing here? Can, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot to draw from, but could you maybe give us like one or two things uh, that you think that people should be armed with that maybe if we haven't read Mike Davis or Rob Wallace that maybe we're not yet? Yeah, I think the key thing is, um, you know, industrialized food production, right? So both, both Davis, you know, gets into this, um, looking at um, uh, the different influenza strains, of course, the um, avian flu or um, H5N, all the varieties, all the influenza A's, you know, that, uh, and that go along with that. Um, and um, also what I took from Davis, I think is very important, and this gets translated into, into, into Wallace's book too, is um, the lack of um, preparation. 
I mean, I think we, we're seeing this already. I mean, this is what Tim was talking about and written about and uh, the complete lack of interest in governments to, to deal with the, with the monster, which is the, the possibility of uh, an outbreak like H5N1 or H1N1 or whatever, uh, uh, you know, that, that kills at such a heavy, you know, high percentage. Um, um, and governments uh, are not investing in this. Um, they're, and pharmaceutical companies are not investing in this, right? Because their bread and butter are diseases that can be, you know, prolonged diseases like, you know, diabetes, uh, heart issues, cancer, and stuff like that. That's where their money goes. That's where their, most of their investment goes, in fact. When it should be going to, you know, controlling uh, the, the real possibility of the situation we're in now, which is a mass pandemic. Uh, of course, you know, COVID is not probably nearly as deadly, right, as something like MERS or SARS or, or whatever. But at the same time, you know, this is like a sort of prediction for the future. Um, and so, so I think it's important. And so, you know, Wallace is very much focused on the agribusiness, you know, and, and how that, um, you know, and food, re you know, and industrialized food production and how that plays a significant role in, um, and of course, there's a debate here you know, about where it comes from and so forth. But, but definitely he's locating, you know, this in, in capitalism itself, which I think is central point overall. Yeah. You're muted. So, you know, the thing is, I, when I try, to, I, I try to spare you the sound of my tapping keys oh, yeah. when I'm sending someone a message and then I forget to demute myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really recommend Mike Davis's interviews. He's done a number of interviews and articles uh, Jacobin and other places, uh, shorter and longer ones, really, really insightful stuff, uh, deep dives that are really worth the time. Um, yeah, he, it's, it's scary, some of the stuff he says, but I think it's, it's well grounded. Um, Nicole, would you like to join the conversation? I'd love to, love to bring in another voice and then maybe hear, uh, hear Tim's thoughts as well. I know I've, I've been uh, bringing it back to Tim as well. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two uh, things that I've been reading. Uh, about a week ago, in a pit of despair, I decided I needed to find something to read that could give me some kind of vision for the future. So I've been reading Viking Economics by George Lakey, um, how the Scandinavians got it right and how we can too. So I'm not that far into it, only a couple chapters, but I just read the chapter about Iceland and the 2008 financial crash. And it talks, uh, the big difference between us and Iceland is that Iceland did not bail out the banks. Um, and so I've been thinking about that kind of our future. And the other thing that is the big point in the book about all the Scandinavian countries is their commitment to women leaders and their commitment to the family uh, for working people and how people can go to work and have maternity leave, maternity leave, and come back part time. And that's something I've struggled with since having kids. And so, uh, like I said, I'm not that far in, but I'm already kind of a little more positive about imagining, you know, what our future could be like post pandemic and post election possibly. So uh, I recommend that. And then like I said, I have two kids. I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old. So if anyone has kids in their lives, I have a children's book to recommend. Um, this is called Love Z by Jesse Sima. And uh, my kids are not old enough to understand what the pandemic is, but they're old enough to be upset. Uh, every day they wake up and ask me if things are open yet. Why can't we see grandma? Why can't we go to the park? Why can't we go to the museum? Just every day. Um, so as a parent, I'm trying to deal with that. Books are a great way to talk to kids about stuff. And so this book, we got in a book exchange since the libraries are closed. We've been doing book exchange with all their little friends. And it's just a really sweet story about a robot who finds a letter that says love Beatrice on it. And the robot goes on a mission to find out what love means. Um, and so the illustrations are really great. This is my kid's favorite page at the park and the kids are saying all the different things they love. You know, they love butterflies and lawn gnomes and. It's just really sweet. Um, and at the end, you know, the robot finds out that it knew what love was all along. So if you're looking for something uplifting to read to children, it's a, uh, I really recommend it. You know, thank you so much for that, Nicole. Actually, Tim and I and Seren had been talking about maybe doing a show in, the, in a few weeks uh, on, you know, what to tell the children, right? Uh, but kind of a different would be kind of a different twist for us. Not, you know, maybe a chance to talk about children's literature, 
but also I, I can only imagine I'm not having kids myself, but, um, but, you know, nephews and nieces, you know, the different issues that are coming up around parenting and, and uh, what stories to tell and, and not tell and, and how people are navigating that right now. I, maybe, maybe we could have you back. Yeah, that'd be great. That one as well. Um, it's, I've just been told by my producer uh, that we actually only have a couple, I mean, we're a couple minutes shy of eight o'clock. Um, technically, we, you know, we can certainly go longer, but we try to keep to an hour. Um, it is eight o'clock right now. Uh, so, you know, I think we can certainly stay on late, but for the sake of our, our audience, at home, I think I, I uh, not seeing any burning, burning hands up at the moment, uh, a burning hand, a burning comment. I, I would like to just say uh, thank you all for uh, joining us for our first kind of round table. Uh, Tim, do you have a closing thought that you'd like to share on what you've heard, what we've been talking about today before? Well, I'd just like to say that it's, it's a challenge for all of us to keep a sense of community and to stay connected. And we, and sure and Joe and I developed this show because we know there's a need for people to feel connected and to keep their spirits up. And uh, if we can play a part in that, then, then, then we will. But we encourage everyone to, to reach out to people. Uh, call someone you haven't talked to in years. Tell them you're thinking of them uh, and be connected with other people because it's so important when we're all stuck in our places. Yeah. We have a Do this again. Do it again. I, that's actually you're the second one Richard Mary yeah. and Richard and actually Karen who we haven't heard from Karen would you like to share a thought um you mentioned that you'd like us to do this do this topic again would you uh I think that's a great idea our idea was that at least once a month we or so we would do a kind of more social roundtable uh episode both to give ourselves a break and and to kind of open it up a little bit so we're definitely uh and of course we could do them more than that uh, there's no, you know, now that the semester's ending for some of us, I'll have a little more time for, for this project. Uh, Karen, are you there? I'm here. We, I'm not to put you on the spot too much, but is there anything you like to say besides do it again? <laughs> well, I've been reading a lot. I'm, I read about three books a week, and um, I find that I can read a book more easily than an article. So I've been reading a lot about epidemics, the history, and I also read things like Kissing Babies at the Piggly Wiggly <laughs> to keep things light. But I edit a blog called multiracialunity.org with Ellen Isaacs. And um, we write about different multiracial struggles. And the latest one is called Public Health During the Time of Epidemics, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And so for that, I do a lot of reading and just finished Lori Garrett's Betrayal of Trust which is an excellent history of what goes right and wrong in different countries handling epidemics. And um, Colin Whitehead, who wrote The Underground Railroad, actually wrote something called Zone One, which is like a terrifying novel about people cleaning bodies up after an epidemic. And it's very similar to the reality today. So, I mean, I have other things to recommend, but I would certainly like to do this again. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, if you could, um, you're, you're welcome. And anyone who's interested in following up, we are looking for people to become more involved in this project, uh, whether it's helping us just with a single themed episode. Really, we started as a few people chatting over, you know, just try, actually it was a day the Facebook went down. And we were trying to make sure we wouldn't lose touch if the corporate model had decided to turn on us even more than more openly. And so we're really a small group and we would welcome Karen, you and others, uh, your input, your suggestions, as well as, uh, you know, if you, if you want to get involved beyond that, you can, you can uh, email joe at shelterandsolidarity.org and that will be uh, redirected to my Gmail account effectively. We also, you can check out our website, shelterandsolidarity.org to see past episodes which uh, those of you, we'd love to build the community, not only week by week, but uh, you know, in a more comprehensive sense. Next week, our show, actually, we will be back to a guest-driven um, you know, format, but we will definitely make some space. And John Mayerhofer, I hope you'll be back with us too. I've reached out to some of your union folks at CUNY uh, to, to, to participate, and I'd love to have you there too. Our next week's show will focus on the way in which this COVID crisis has presented an opportunity for powers that be, corporate and state powers to, to take, to basically uh, 
rip at our public institutions and threaten the common good. We will have a guest from the, the Postal Service who's talking about what's happening at the Postal Service. We'll have uh, representatives um, from UMass Boston, my institution where Linda and I work, where we're, we're fighting austerity in various forms, old and new. And we, we hope to have folks from the CUNY system as well, um, and, and as well as from other public institutions that are fighting uh, battles old and new. Um, to keep alive the very means of a, of a public uh, common good in this in this in this moment, uh, that'll be next week. We will stay at seven o'clock, uh, so please join us uh, as we move towards wrapping up. I would like to thank our co-sponsors. We have four co-sponsors for the show: Encuentro Cinco, uh, the journal Socialism and Democracy, the magazine Labor Press, and the uh, publishing house Hardball Press, which publishes working class stories. Um, I'd also like to thank Matt Callahan, uh, who has allowed us to use the song Shelter, which opens and closes this program. I'd like to thank my co-producer. Strength that does